Good morning, everyone. I'm Judy, and I'm with the Washoe County Library System, and welcome to Art Town Mondays with the Nevada Historical Society. Today's topic is Mining Then and Now by Sam Macaluso. I just want to give a huge shout out to the Nevada Historical Society for converting this in-person event to a virtual event. We appreciate their commitment to supporting our community with educational events like these. To learn more about the Nevada Historical Society, visit their website at nvhistoricalsociety.org. And now I'd like to give a great big welcome and introduce Linda Burke and Sam Macaluso with the Nevada Historical Society. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Judy. Good morning. Hello, my name is Linda Burke and I am a docent volunteer at the Nevada Historical Society. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this series of history talks brought to you by the, the Society and the Washoe County Library System. Thank you very much to Judy, my co-host today. I have led school tours at the Nevada Historical Society for many years and have also been on the docent council board. And I want to share with you some, some of the pleasure I have in working there over the years. The Nevada Historical Society is the oldest cultural institution in the state of Nevada. And it was founded in 1904 by Jeannie Weir, a professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, who was very concerned at that time by the rapidly disappearance or the rapid disappearance of the past in Nevada due to the boom and bust cycle of its economics. She set about personally collecting all that she could to preserve its artifacts and print materials. She went about by writing letters to old timers to record their memories. She traveled by horse and, and wagon and, and, and sometimes by train in her summers and on the weekends to collect and store items in her own home. She got company directors to donate. Um, she, that is why we, today we have the 20, horse, the 20 mule team in our gallery. She gathered a lot of photographs, thousands of them, including um, today we have the oldest known photograph taken in Nevada of the July 4th parade in Virginia City in the early 1860s. The Nevada Historical Society is located at 1650 North uh, Virginia Street on the campus of the University of Nevada, Reno. It consists of a museum and a research library um, it is suggested that you go to the website to find the hours of operation. We, it is going to be open from July 15th, that is this week. Admission is $5 and free for children under 17. The hours of opening are first come first serve from 10 to 4 on Wednesdays to the public and then by appointment only from Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, the research library is open by appointment only and the um, forms are available online. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, we are currently correct, collecting people's memoirs, people's um, notes and letters about how they are spending these, um, do these terrible times. Just like Jeannie Weir wrote to the old timers, we want you to, to write and share your, your memoirs. So if you have some letters or some information about how you've been celebrating anniversaries or, or times together, would you please email them or write them to our director? Um, uh, and the address is on this side here. Of course, um, when you visit the society, social distancing masks are, are mandatory. Um, now I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Sam Macaluso. He is a native Nevada, born and raised in Reno and Sparks. He's been a banker, a teacher and a a Nevada Air National Guardsman. His passion is Nevada history and he is a fellow docent and is also currently the president of the docent council at the Nevada Historical Society. He has loved teaching fourth grade, that's the special grade where we learn about Nevada history. In 1990, he created the persona of Sagebrush Sam. Now Sagebrush Sam is a miner. I'm not sure if he will make an appearance today, but as the topic is mining, you may want to watch out for him. Sam, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce him. Um, I have worked with Sam on school tours and his great love and, and shared his great love for children. So today I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing his talk on mining now and then. Sam, it's over to you. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Linda, and thank you, everybody, and welcome. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I've done this on a couple of occasions, mostly live, but so this will be a little bit interesting. And yes, we're going to talk a little bit about mining then and now. And mining goes back, not, you know, just in the foreseeable future, but it goes back as far as 10,000 years ago with Native Americans. And as you can see on this slide, there's uh, Native American projectiles, some of them going back 10,000 years. Uh, we have found things here such as beads and shells and, and other things. So we know that many thousands of years ago, Native Americans uh, or the early Americans uh, traded with uh, people say on the coast. And so we know that mining was done then. We have found some turquoise sites down in uh, southern Nevada that we know are several thousand years old, at least 3,000 years old. And so we know that mining has taken place for a long time. Um, you talked about Sagebrush Sam. Well, here he is. There's Sagebrush Sam, the oldest living miner in Nevada. And people like him are basically a thing of the past. You don't see the old prospector with either his mule or in this case his ore card out digging around in the, uh, in the hills, prospecting for gold or other precious metals. This, this guy is one of a kind. Instead, what we see is we see mostly, you know, gold panner here and people do go gold panning and it's more of a fun and hobby type thing. Um, in California, you can go down on the American River and the Yuba River, and if you make sure you don't go on somebody's gold, uh, on somebody's claim, um, you might be able to find some, what we might call flower gold, real small, small, small pieces of uh, gold. And that's kind of what, what goes on now. This is, this is what we would might call open or modern mining, because this is an open pit mine near Winnemucca, Nevada. Most operations now are open pit where millions of tons of dirt are removed to get to the ore body. Uh, there still are a few underground mine sites that are here in Nevada, but most of them are the, as you see here, open pit. Um, you kind of get an idea. This is the, these are the walls they're working. Actually, they're working right along here. Down below, you might find equipment uh, this might be the problem is sometimes the water table uh, is low enough where they'll get some water in and water has to be pumped out. So you might see huge pumps down here pumping out water sometimes, but this is the traditional, what we see now here in Nevada, the open pit mine. The first nugget that was found was found in Gold Creek in 1850 near Dayton, and it was a group of um, people that were headed to the gold fields and got stuck on this side of the Sierra Nevadas. And so near Dayton, they went to Gold Creek, um, were panning and a gold nugget was found. And so they worked their way up Gold Creek um, looking and, and found some color. You know, a good prospector never calls it gold. They always call it color because you never knew if this was a solid piece of gold or not. Um, but, you know, because it could have some other things in it. It could have uh, copper, it could have silver, it could have uh, quartz, it could, you know, just be what we would call an amalgam. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily a gold, you know, a gold, actual gold nugget, 100% gold. This particular nugget is now on display in the Carson City Museum, and it was the first one that was found. So as they worked their way up the hill, guess what? They ran into, out of, coming out of the Ophir mine, um, the creek, the Gold Creek that came out of there, um, and they discovered that it was in the hills, and the Comstock load was discovered. Here it says 8 June 1859. This is McLaughlin and O'Reilly. Uh, the two prospectors that actually discovered it. How the name Comstock got in is because uh, Henry Comstock happened to be uh, venturing up into the hills. He was kind of a, oh, he was, he was a pretty lazy guy. 
and they used to call him old pancake because the story goes that he never made biscuits. He never let allowed biscuits to rise. He just would uh, let them be flat like pancakes and he would eat them that way because he was just too lazy to, to wait for them to rise up. Anyway, he comes upon these two guys and says, hey, you're, you're prospecting my claim, which actually wasn't his. And so the, the, the name ended up sticking um, even though all three of these men sold out early and were basically were paupers. They had no idea what value was in the Comstock load. In today's money, it would have been billions of dollars that would have come out of the Comstock load in today's money. Um, and so the Comstock load basically took off and this is in its heyday, this is what it looked like. These are all claims. These are all claims. It says that the best job to have on the Comstock was that of a, of a lawyer because you were spending all your time trying to settle claims amongst all these people that were claiming these areas. See, the way it works in, in the mining laws in those days was if you happen to find the head, uh, the beginning of a, of a vein, you could follow that vein wherever it went. And so even if it worked its way down into somebody else's claim, that vein, if you could prove that you found the original source of that, you could go and mine through this person, these people's claims. Now, the, the really, this is where William Stewart got his, you know, made his fortune as, a, as one of the top attorneys. And I believe on the 27th of this month, um, Lorraine Peterson will be doing a talk on William Stewart, and she will probably touch on and probably talk about him uh, as one of the top lawyers in the Comstock and, you know, where he made a, a lot of his fortune um, in the Comstock area from processing and from adjudicating these claims here. Nowadays, before any work starts, you have to, you use a computer and a computer now, and this is the difference between then and now, instead of following a, an ore body, now you find an ore body. Let's say you do your exploration, you find an ore body, then you try to figure out where it is. And so you will try, you will have to uh, lay it out by computer. Now this is kind of an interesting thing because from the time you stake a claim to the time you first put a shovel in the ground, it could be as many as 10 years because there's a lot of permitting that has to be done. Uh, they have to do environmental studies to make sure that there's no endangered species of any type that there. They also, they do archeological sites to make sure there isn't some archeological um, uh, site that could, have, that, that could be disrupted by this open pit mine. So it's really kind of interesting, uh, all the permitting that goes through before actually you see uh, work done. And, and the other thing is the feasibility. I mean, you know, you could find an ore body, but that ore body really doesn't have what you want or, or the quality of, of the precious metal you're looking for or the metal you're looking for. And so it's, it's not worth spending hundreds of millions of dollars to get the operation up if you can't uh, make a profit out of it. So there's a lot of things that go into this before you can even get started. Um, one of the things right now, lithium is the big thing, you know, with the Tesla plant that's out there in, uh, in uh, just uh, east of Sparks. Um, right now, we only have in the state of Nevada and in the United States, there is only one lithium mine and it's in Silver Peak and it's down south of Tonopah. And that is the only active lithium mine currently. However, in the last few years, there have been 15,000 claims for lithium mines uh, that, have been, that have been processed through the, uh, the state. Okay, so 15,000 claims, but that doesn't mean that there's gonna be 15,000 mine sites throughout the state of Nevada. Uh, one of them happens to be in the Black Rock Desert where Burning Man takes place. 
And it's kind of interesting because people are saying, well, Burning Man's going to go away. Well, like I said before, it may be 10 years before um, anything gets done out there. And the quality of the lithium may not be such that it's even going to be worth it. So, you know, we, 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 you know, you get excited about things like that, but it's sometimes they just don't pan out. But nowadays, what we have is, is we have microscopic gold. Gold ha is so small that you need a microscope. And the two big areas are this Battle Mountain Eureka trend and this Carlin trend. This is where the microscopic gold is being found now. Uh, it started in the 1960s, it says 1964 for the Carlin trend. It's been producing gold ever since. We have a couple of other places. This one here is Core Rochester, which is primarily a silver operation. Um, and it's located just outside of Lovelock. Um, and then down here in the south, these two, this is the Round Mountain uh, complex, which is uh, just to the east of Tonopah. Uh, and it's it's interesting because in, in this, you find microscopic gold, but you also find what we call free-formed gold. In other words, gold you can actually see in the rock itself. And so this has, you know, this is a, a little interesting uh, uh, development down here in, in southern part of Nevada. Now, going back to some the way it was before. Before, I talked about underground mining. Well, the problem with the Comstock was the ground was so soft that you had a lot of cave-ins. So how do you fix that? Well, a fellow by the name of Philip Dietesheimer, uh, the story goes that he was looking at um, beehives and how beehives were constructed and saw that if you, you know, he thought, well, if we put timber underneath as we take out ore, we replace it with timbers, that'll shore up the underground ore by, you know, the, the underground uh, mine that we're taking all the ore out and, and it shouldn't collapse. And so you need to use planks. We actually have one of the timbers that came out of the Comstock on display at the Historical Society. So if you should go there, look for one of the timbers that's uh, from the uh, Comstock and you need wood. So where do you get the wood? Well, you get the wood from up at Lake Tahoe and up on Mount Rose. And it's said that, and there are pictures that by 1900, there was not one tree around uh, Lake Tahoe or Mount Rose. And it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that now when we see all the forested area up there. But once upon a time, there was no wood there. And all that wood, was used to put underneath the mines of Virginia City. It was used to build the towns of Virginia City, uh, probably Reno and Carson City also. And that's where all the wood ended up. Um, so I've always told kids that if you have, if, if we had a, a, a huge uh, earthquake up there in Virginia City, the town could end up as a giant sinkhole because that this is where all the timber is. And that timber is about 150, 160 years old now. So, you know, it's, it's all still there underneath uh, Virginia City. These were huge Cornish pumps that were brought in to pump water out of the mines. That was one of the problems with the underground mines. They had water um, also to pump fresh air down there because one of the problems too was you didn't have fresh air and you could run into pockets of bad air. And it's, it's interesting because they used to have these little candles and we, um, they had candle displays there or little candles that were on a spike. And what you did was you set them down the mine shaft and then you watched. And if the, if the candles started to go out without you know, getting to the very end, you knew the air was bad because they needed air for, you know, for the uh, candles to burn and you better get out of that mine shaft because the air was bad and you could suffocate from bad air. One of the ways that they used to crush the ore with in the Comstock was this. This is a stamp mill. This is a three stamp mill. Uh, ore would come in through the bottom slot down here. And these things on this camshaft, these things are offset. So they don't all strike at the same time. And these, these 
camshafts would come down and they would slam into the ore or the rock and they would crush the rock. And so this was used, they used steam. So another source of the wood up at the Comstock was to produce steam to run these stamp mills. <clears throat> um, you can see stamp, there's, a, there's actually a stamp mill in the Hawthorne Museum. Um, if you happen to go on Interstate 80, you get to uh, heading west at Auburn and you take the Auburn, the old Auburn exit, there's a three stamp mill that's just sitting off to the side of the road. You can get an idea of what it looked like. And I think there's even one, there is one that's up there just below um, the fourth, fourth Ward School in um, Virginia City. And if you look down off of the Fourth Ward School, there is a, an old uh, stamp there. I, I can't remember if it's a three stamp or, or what. After they did that, they would put them in these big vats and they would put uh, uh, mercury, mercury is a heavy metal, and they would also put uh, salts and other things and steam, and they would extract the gold and silver from um, the waste rock or the other rock. Problem is, this is only about 75% effective. And then what they did in those days was they would dump the mercury down Gold Creek as well, you know, and so it would end up down in the Carson River and they would also use it in the mills down along the Carson River. And all that went into the Carson River, all this mercury, which now is sitting in the bottom of Lake Lahontan. And so this is why they tell you not to eat a lot of the, you know, you can eat portions of the fish that you catch from Lake Lahontan, but don't eat large quantities because supposedly it has mercury in it. So anyway, and some of you might remember, I do, I know I do, um, we used to have those mercury thermometers and so we would break the thermometer and play with the mercury. Now, if, if they happen to have one and it breaks in a school, they evacuate the school for a week because you gotta do deep uh, cleaning contamination because you know it's, it's uh, heavy metal. We used to play with the stuff, but it's the way it is now. Okay, this is an open pit mine up in Elko County. Just to give you an idea, these are 400 ton haul trucks. This is a 200 ton shovel. And what it's doing is it's picking up the rock and it's putting it in there. Um, on average, on average, one of these haul trucks, 400 tons of material will yield one ounce of gold. Now that's kind of misleading because as you can see, these two towers that I, I got my pointer on back here, hopefully you can see it. These two towers are plotting out what's going to be blasted next. And if you look right here, these are two gentlemen right here. So this gives you an idea of the, the volume and the size and scope of this operation. But anyway, you know, so 400 tons for one ounce. But see, the problem is too. Let's say you have this bank here and you're gonna blast this bank. Okay, maybe the top 10 feet of this, you're gonna blast 20 feet of this, let's say. The top 10 feet might be what we call waste rock. Well, waste rock has nothing in it. So all that has to be moved out and put someplace before you get down here where the ore body is and where your, where your precious metal might be. And so this is why it's kind of misleading because you might get down here and you might get one truck that might produce four or five ounces of, of, let's say, gold. But all this waste rock had to be moved first. And so that's why it comes up with an average that the average of a 400 ton haul truck is one ounce of gold. Now to give you an idea of that too, okay, I looked at today's prices. Today's prices are, it's $1,818 for an ounce of gold. Operation costs to run a mine like this are a little over $1,000 an ounce. And that's for all the operation. That's for employee salaries, that's for equipment, that's for um, gasoline or diesel in this case, electricity to run some of the plants. Everything is a little over uh, $1,000 an ounce to run, which leaves you, let's, let's give it a round figure, let's say $750 per ounce profit. Well, for a mine to be effective, you want to uh, produce about a million ounces. 
So we'll figure it out. A million ounces, $750 profit. That's $750 million of profit that a company is making off of a mine. And that's just in one year. So, you know, kind of interesting. To give you an idea too, here's a six foot man. This is a 400 ton haul truck. Those tires are 12, at least 12 feet tall because he's right there halfway. Um, if one of these tires were to blow up, it would have the equivalency of uh, 20,000 pounds of dynamite, just to give you a, a comparison. This cab up here is sitting up here at, it's about three stories high. So to, if when you're up here, you're up about three stories uh, in, you know, in, in height. Um, these tires cost more than half a million dollars a piece. So sometimes what they will do, depending on the ground that they're in, um, they may put chains around these tires on all the tires. And there's, there's gonna be 10 tires. Well, eight, let's say six tires. Two, two duels in the back and these two on the front. So six tires, they will put chains on them to save the, the tires because it's much easier to, to buy a pair of chains than it is a half a million dollar tire. So it's just, just the, the, the size and the scope of this operation. Nowadays, we use a thing called cyanide and that's how we extract it now. Um, and they use sodium cyanide. Uh, this, you can read this, I'm just gonna, kind of go over it real quick. Cyanide is interesting because cyanide you can get in liquid form. And if you were to take cyanide and you took say a cup of cyanide and you poured it say on a concrete uh, sidewalk, it would evaporate and leave no trace of anything. The bad part is, is if cyanide gets into groundwater, then it contaminates groundwater. So steps have to be taken to make sure that you don't uh, contaminate the groundwater. And I will show you that in an upcoming slide. And so what they do is they will make a, about a 5% solution. And here it says it's about a thousand, thousand to one when they, and they apply it to what we call a leach pad. And they'll run things like a sprink, like a, um, not a, a sprinkling system or a drip system. And they run that through there and, um, that's how they will science, that's how they will uh, extract gold and silver. And it's about 92 to 95% efficient. Remember I told you uh, with, with mercury, it was maybe 75% efficient. And I didn't tell you, back east, there were actually some books that stated that the streets of Virginia City are paved in silver and gold. And they were, because that waste rock that came off of the you know, once they finished extracting what gold and silver they could, they used the waste rock to, to uh, um, grate the streets with. And so you had at least 25% gold and silver in that waste rock that was being used to, to pave the streets of Virginia, of Virginia City. <clears throat> Nowadays, most of the gold is taken out. And this is what it looks like. Well, and this was the first one. The first, it's interesting because the first cyanide plant was in a place called Delamar in Lincoln County. And cyanide was actually developed by a Professor Jackson from the University of Nevada, Reno, Nevada. And he found that by running a diluted solution of cyanide, it would extract small amounts of gold and silver out of waste rock. And he used waste rock from up in Virginia City. So he took some of the waste rock that they used to pave the streets with and found that he could extract gold and silver. So they tried it on a large scale and, and the first one was in the town of Delamar. And they had cyanide plants here and they were actually able to extract gold and silver. And just kind of an aside, um, it, in the 1890s till about 1900, um, Nevada was in a really bad depression. And many people left the state of Nevada. As a matter of fact, by the, the census of 1900 showed that Nevada only had 25,000 residents. And that was actually about as many as when we became a state in 1864. So, you know, um, there was, this was about the only town that was producing gold to keep the economy of Nevada running. 
And it's, it's kind of interesting because there were actually talk in Congress of taking statehood away from Nevada and making it a territory again or dividing it up and giving part to California, part to Arizona and part to Utah. So, you know, then in 1900, um, Butler founded, you know, found the Tonopah strike, the big strike in Tonopah right after in 1902, uh, Goldfield was the big strike. And, and by 1905, Goldfield had more people, had about 30,000 people. So more people than they actually had in 1900 and was in one town. It was the second largest town in the west part of the United States next to uh, San Francisco was the town of Goldfield, Nevada. So kind of interesting. Here's the way it works. You have these lifts and in between these is where you would put your drip system. And up on the very top, you might have some oscillating sprinklers. And what would happen is you pump the cyanide solution up here. It drips through these um, different lifts and the lifts can be anywhere, depends on the type of rock you use. Some type, you know, some rock that's very um, porous and very light, you know, that didn't have to be crushed very much. You might be able to make 20 foot lifts. Rock that's hard, that had to be crushed, you might only make 10 foot lifts. And so these lifts are put in there. They're put at an angle because down below you have a plastic uh, membrane that would trap to make sure that the cyanide does not go into the water and into the water supply. It goes down into a pool, which is it's uh, called a pregnant pond and a pregnant solution means that it's gold, um, it's, it's gold bearing cyanide and silver bearing cyanide because cyanide, what happens, this microscopic gold that I talked about will attach itself to cyanide and it goes down in here. Then this solution is pumped into a processing plant. They add zinc and what happens is zinc will, uh, is more of an attractant to the cyanide than gold and silver. So the gold and silver will drop off. The zinc will attach itself to the pregnant solution Later on, you separate those two and you can repump the cyanide back up and recycle this. So very little is lost. The only thing that's really lost is to evaporation, but this stuff is recycled a lot. And again, it's 90, 92 to 95% efficient. I put this picture in here because this is actually modern mining. Women once upon a time were considered bad luck at least if they went underground. They could be up on the, on the surface. They could be on the surface as secretaries or you know, help out as long as they weren't underground. But as soon as they went underground, the miners left. And there is a picture of, um, at that time, General Grant, this is after he uh, left the presidency. He came to visit Virginia City, him and his wife. Um, he got to go all the way down to the bottom of the mine shaft. She did not. She had to wait at the top of the mine shaft because if she was to go down, all the miners were going to get out of the mine shaft because they felt that if a woman went down there, it would be bad luck and you would have a collapse. The mine would uh, collapse. And so they were bad luck. And only until about maybe 15 years ago were women allowed to go underground. And that's what this is. And the other mining uh, thing is, this is a remote control truck. In this case, this is a haul truck. Uh, they have remote control shovel trucks that, were, that are working back in this underground mine. And they would load this up and then you would have like a joystick that you would have in your lap and you would be able to, um, by moving that, would be able to work this truck. And so that's, that's the modern mine, you know, it, it, it protects miners from going underground and being caught in a cave in. But this is, this is modern mining, a woman underground. And the other thing, and this is probably my last slide is, is now they use drones and drones are used for a lot of different things. Because we do still have some underground mines, uh, they will put air sensors on these drones as well as cameras. And they will go, they will send the camera after they do a blast underground to survey the blast area, plus to check the air quality to make sure that, again, there's not bad air, that you happen to run into a pocket of bad air 
and you may need breathing equipment to go underneath the mines because they do have a ventilation system underneath, but sometimes you run into some bad air where they have to actually put on um, oxygen tanks and breathing equipment to actually uh, be able to work underneath there. Um, this, and, and also they, they check to see what the blast area looks like to make sure, you know, and, and check the stability of the underground uh, mine. They also use this to check the high wall, you know, on, on an actual mine pit. You check what they call the high walls because if they're too steep of an angle, you could have some runoff, especially if it gets wet. You know, if, it's, if you get rain or precipitation, you might have uh, slides that come down. And so you had to be real careful there. So they use drones for a lot of things. Uh, they also use drones with infrared lasers uh, rather than have somebody wandering around the hills, they will send a drone up and a drone can go down and look into the, into the actual ground and see if they find what they call a hot spot, which could be a, uh, an ore body. And then they'll send somebody out to do sampling and take the samples. And I understand uh, Linda's husband does the uh, uh, mineralogy and checks the quality of the ore sample to see if it's worth, you know, something that's worth uh, pursuing but they can use a drone to, to save the manpower of going out and actually picking it. They can check this, you know, they can look at the various heat, uh, leap, heap leeches to see if um, the, the leeches, you know, maybe there's a, a, a break in the, in the pipe. And so they can use this without having to climb up there and do that. So drones are used for a lot of things. And basically that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions out there, Linda, that you know of? Yes, we do have a few. Okay. So um, Stephen wants to know, is there any active mining on the Comstock today? Yeah, well, okay. I'd have to say yes and no. There is what they call the, the Comstock Mining Company. And the Comstock Mining Company is going through and um, it's at the kind of at the far end of the Comstock. And what they did is they opened up some, some pits and there is some open pit mining that, that's going on now. They, they have been going on and off. So right now, I don't know if the mine is still in operation, but yes, there was uh, a mining operation. They actually did open some of the pits up, you know, some of the underground mining and actually um, broke into some of the timbers from the old shafts that are there. Supposedly they claim there's, uh, you know, and, and it could be because you see in the old days, when you quit seeing gold and silver, you figured that the mine had petered out and it was done. But nowadays we can check for microscopic gold using uh, high powered microscopes. And if they do find uh, traces of microscopic gold, Yes, it may be worthwhile to go in there. So yeah, there could, there, there was, let me say this, up until about three or four years ago, there was mining going on up in the Comstock. I'm not sure if the mine is still open or if it's kind of in a hiatus status right now. Thank you, Sam. Also, okay. um, Allison is interested in learning what are the places where mercury could have been dumped, like the Carson River Lake, the Haunton. Do you know about anything dumped into Washoe Lake? or the history of mining around the Washoe Lake watershed? No, it didn't, it didn't go that way because they would, they would put it into the, into the creeks that ran out of the Comstock that ran down towards uh, the Dayton area because there were several um, silver and gold uh, processing plants down along, the Com uh, along Dayton. They didn't have any on the other side, okay? On the other side, what you had was you had the problem with timber, okay? So where the, the mercury would go, would be on the, well, let's see, it'd be on the east side and go down to towards Dayton and down towards the Carson River. That's where they would dump all the mercury. On the west side, up in the Galena area and Galena Forest, and you had uh, Galena Creek and Ofer Creek, Thomas Creek, White Creek, they did a lot of timbering. And so what they would do is all the sage, all of the, 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 the chips, the, the wood chips and things like that, and the, and the debris that was from the wood went into those creeks. And those creeks were basically um, polluted from wood. As a matter of fact, 
uh, and Verdi, they had a lot of um, um, timber. And it's said that the consistency of the Truckee River would look like oatmeal in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, it, it was so bad that, the, but it wasn't mercury pollution. It was pollution from the sawmills. Okay, Marriott wants to know what happened to all the material after they dig it out, all the rocks, I imagine. Okay. There is, once you take it out, there is a process that you have to put in a, a bit, you have to put in a, a, a bond for reclamation. Okay. So even though there is those gigantic holes, they don't, once, once a mine uh, plays out, and there are some up by rhyolite and right on the edge of the um, uh, Death Valley, there's one particular mine up near rhyolite, <coughs> and it is no longer in use. And what happens is water will seep into the bottom of that mine, and so you actually have water down there. Another good example is out by Yarrington. Anaconda mines, those mines are played out. And so what there are, are they're just huge open pits and water will fill into those things. They don't fill those mines back up. So you still have holes out in Nevada landscape, okay? Instead, what they do is that rock has to be, uh, they, they, the waste rock and the uh, rock that, that's, that comes out of the, you know, after the heap leach, is reclaimed. In other words, you have to try to put the landscape back the way you found it. There are some really good uh, examples of, of reclamation. Uh, Core Rochester is one of them. When I first went up there was, I'd say it was at least 15, almost 20 years ago. Um, it was just a small operation. It wasn't a very big operation. Now it's a huge operation and it's gone back into the hills a bit. And all the front area that looks like it's part of the landscape is actually reclaimed land from, from that. And if you wanna see a real good example of a reclamation project, go to the Sparks Marina. The Sparks Marina is a, re is a reclamation project because that used to be the Helms Pit and it was a huge open pit where they took out rock that they used to pave Interstate 80 with. And so they left these, this gigantic hole. And then after the flood of 97, when it actually started to fill up with water, they said, what can we do? And so they made that uh, Sparks Marina. So Sparks Marina is a reclamation project from a giant open pit. And that's what they have to do. The, the, one of the requirements when you're starting to, you know, is that you have to reclaim the land back to where it, it was prior. So they actually will taper the hills. They will plant uh, native, plant, native uh, plants on there. Uh, things like they have to replant sagebrush. They have to replant some of the native plants. They put in uh, rocks and gigantic, you know, big boulder area, uh, boulders up there so that animals will have a place to hide, you know, the smaller animals such as squirrels and, and mice and, and rats and things like that. So they have to put it back the way they it was, but the hole itself, the mine pit itself, doesn't get reclaimed. It just, nature will reclaim it itself. Thanks, Sam. Stephen Drew says, thank you very much, nice job. And then there's a question, is any silver mining still active in Nevada today? The main one is Core Rochester. Core Rochester, which is just outside of Lovelock, is about 92% silver, 8% gold. But it's, it's uh, still an active mine, and that is the, uh, the main, main source is silver. Um, it's, it's kind of, it, 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 you can't really say it's silver, but many of the gold mines that we have now uh, in Nevada, it's not just gold. There's gold and silver, but at different degrees. Um, I've been to a couple mines where um, they have gotten 80% sil gold, 20% silver. So what they'll do is they'll pour what they call a doré bar. A doré bar is, a, is not a pure bar. In other words, it's a bar that is a, is a mixture of gold and silver. They call it doré. It's spelled D-O-R-E, but it's French. 
and you can see a, 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 a silver sheen to it, even though the bar itself looks like it's gold. And then there's others where there might be 10% silver all the way down to 2% silver. Uh, you know, so it, some of those mines might be pure, but as far as an actual silver mine, the main silver mine in Nevada is the core Rochester mine, which is located outside of Lovelock. Okay. Thank you, Sam. So okay. I think that's all of our questions. Okay. So thank you again for attending and thank you for yes. the Washoe County Library System too. And come visit our Nevada Historical Society. The details are on your, on your screen and look up the website for more information. Come and see our famous two-headed calf for our yes. famous sack of flour. And um, we'll see you again next time. We also have a, a talk this afternoon on gaming. Thank you. And I wanted to say thank you again. This is Judy with Washoe County Library System. And I wanted to thank um, Linda Burke, of course, Sam Macaluso, Carol Coleman with the Nevada Historical Society for making this event possible. And like I said, converting this um, in-person event to this wonderful virtual event. We really, really appreciate that extra effort there. I just wanted to, again, thank everyone and we'll see you all next time. Tune in today. Mm -hmm.